Hello there, Bobby with Survival Existence back with you. Have you been considering a generator, but you don't know what size to buy? Maybe I can help you. When thinking about purchasing a generator, it can be often very confusing, to put it mildly. There are 2,500 watt, 250 watts, 4,500 watts, 5,000, 6,000, 8,000, and it just goes on and on and on. When you're purchasing a generator, the things you should really think of is how many watts, which is a measure of electrical power that you'll need to run the specific items in your house that you want to run, and then you have to balance that with the amount of fuel consumption that a generator that size will possibly need. And also, another thing that you really do have to keep in mind is that a generator normally that's listed for a specific amount of wattage, the figure they give you is its surge watts. It will not run continuously at that particular power rating. It has a rating that on one hand is surge watts, on the other is continuous watts. The power rating on a generator is often given in surge watts. There are some exceptions, but by and large, most of them, whenever they tell you it's a 5,000 watt generator, it is actually a 5,000 surge watt generator. With this particular generator, it's a Duramax MX4500E. Its rating, according to the label, is 4,500 watts but that is 4,500 surge watts that it's capable of producing. Continuous watts, whenever you read the spec sheets for it, it actually will only run at 3,500 watts continuously. With this continuous watt rating being at 3,500 watts, I normally will consider a generator that will produce at least 20% more power than the actual running watts. That gives me a little bit of cushion for any minor mistakes that I may have made in calculations. Also for a little bit of space for some expansion. A generator does not operate very well at its maximum rated watts. It functions far better if it's operating about 20% below its listed capability of running watts. Most of the time when some bond is contemplating purchasing a generator, they want to uh, purchase the largest one they can afford. And to an extent, that's understandable. You want to be able to run as much as possible inside your home. But there is a drawback, and that drawback is not only the additional expense of a larger generator, but the additional fuel consumption that that generator will take. When a generator manufacturer tells you that it that their particular generator will consume so many gallons per hour. That is at about its 50% operational capability. That's not at 80% where I suggest going no further than, and it's certainly not at 100% of its listed capability. When considering what size generator to purchase, the things you will need to take into consideration is, of course, um, the needed power for the specific items that you feel like you need to run. Some of you will feel like you only need to be able to uh, intermittently run a refrigerator and freezer. Others will actually want their, their water heater running. Some others will want to be able to run dryers and other appliances. Do take into consideration when deciding what size generator you desire that every item that has a heating element in it or um, a motor that likely has a uh, starter capacitor in it will consume far, far more wattage. Usually it's not a great idea whenever you're trying to purchase as small of a generator as possible to consider your coffee maker. It consumes a great deal of electricity. Your clothes dryer, your air conditioner, and heating unit, if they are electric, are very heavy consumers of power, and you may not want to run those particular items, knowing that eventually the power will come back on. 
you'll need to sit down and decide right now what you want to be able to run inside your home before you make a decision on a generator. Another consideration when purchasing a generator is actual fuel consumption and how you're going to store fuel. Another consideration is fuel storage. It does no good to have a generator if you don't have fuel to operate it. Some people have opted if they have natural gas available on their property to purchase a generator that operates on natural gas, which is a pretty good idea, except in times of earthquake. Earthquakes tend to sever stabilized pipes, pulls them in two. So that's not always the answer, although it's a good idea if you're not in an earthquake prone area. Another good idea is to store fuel. You can purchase 12 five gallon gas cans and keep it rotated out every month by removing one of those five gallon gas cans from your storage, putting it in your vehicle tank, going to the gas station and refilling that particular gas can once a month. Also as an alternative, you can purchase 20 or 30 gallon uh, plastic barrels to uh, move your fuel in and keep it rotated. But you will need some sort of hand pump to be able to fill your vehicle from that size of a container. But nonetheless, they're still small enough that you actually can move those containers. Whenever you store fuel, a consideration for that fuel storage is fuel stabilization. Fuel does not store well on its own. It helps if it's kept in a dark, cool place, but that will not fix the problem. Fuel does store better in a dark, cool place, but that's not the answer. It will still go stale. The answer is using a, some sort of fuel stabilizer like Stabil or one of the other various types of items. Use the Stabil for gasoline, for gasoline engines and gasoline storage. Use Stabil for diesel and kerosene for your kerosene and diesel store. And remember, if you're planning to run your refrigerator and freezer to keep the foods in them safe, they don't have to be ran all the time. They can be ran every four to six hours to, and return down to temperature. Then they can be unplugged and other items can be brought back on and operated. One of the biggest secrets to keeping freezers and refrigerators cold is to not be peeking in the door. Leave the door closed. Do consider what items you're planning on running during a power outage. Like I said, a drip coffee maker consumes about 800 watts when it's running. That's a lot of power for a cup of coffee. A better option might be a camp stove and a regular percolator. As you can see, there are some items that are power hogs, to put it mildly, that a lot of people have in their home. And as a consequence, it's best to leave these items off and use some other alternative means to accomplish the task that you're looking to do or just let it wait until after the power is back on. Like I've said before, there is a great deal of issue with generators and the size of them and some of the items inside your home that you may and in some cases may not want to run once you find out how much power they actually use. Uh, home appliances use power. That power is measured in watts. An electrical water heater at 40 gallons uses anywhere from 4,000 to 5,000 watts. That's a great deal of power and you might want to reconsider powering it and then again you may absolutely insist on having that hot water. On an electric stove each element can use anywhere from 1,500 to 2,500 watts. That's a lot of power. Uh, central air conditioning units, uh, one and a half ton unit, which is about 18,000 BTUs, running oh, in the neighborhood of 5,256 watts, but there is an issue with central air conditioning units. Um, that issue is called locked rotor amps. Uh, more or less the type of induction motor that's in an air conditioner and, and in some equipment on startup draws a, a huge amount of amperage. It can be oh as much as three to eight times as many amps on start as it does actually run and as a consequence it'll quite often overload a generator 
and it'll either trip your breaker if you're lucky or it may burn it out. Now there is a kit that you can get and I'm not going to go too deeply in it into that kit but it's called a hard start kit. You can uh, contact your generator dealer and quite often they can at least get you pointed in the right direction if you just insist on running your central air conditioning unit. A better alternative is actually running a window air conditioner that's designed to cool one or two rooms. A uh, window air conditioner unit, uh, about a 10,000 BTU, uh, operating wattage is around 1,200 watts. Its surge wattage is 1,800 watts. And it's usually a far better alternative than trying to cool your whole house. Um, in addition, some houses don't have just one central unit. Sometimes there are two and three and sometimes four depending on the size of the house and also how many stories are in the house. But let it suffice to say that's up to you and you'll have to figure that out yourself. Uh, deep freezer. They can be different depending on the freezer. Some of them use say 500 watts but they'll also take 1500 watts on startup. There are some freezers you can get that the wattage consumption pretty much stays stable. Um, and that's, of course, the kind of freezer that you would normally want to run on a generator. But, uh, of course, then again, that's up to you and you have to do your own homework. Uh, furnace blower can run anywhere from 800 watts to 1,300 surge watts. Uh, computer PC, really that can depend on the PC. They can run anywhere from a couple of hundred watts to six and eight hundred watts easily. That's why most of the time I suggest that you use the laptop. They draw considerably less. Uh, light bulbs are another point of contention. Uh, incandescent lights, if it's a 40 watt bulb, it draws 40 watts. It's the same token of 100 watt bulb. Pulls 100 watts. A better idea if you're going to run a generator is to use LEDs. A 40 watt equivalent bulb with an LED only draws 4 to 5 watts as opposed to the 40 watts for the 40 watt bulb. That's quite a bit of, of savings whenever you're talking about two, three, four lights in your house. I am going to put a PDF on my website and I'll put a link down in the uh, show notes that you can download these two lists and give you a general idea of what the items in your home draws and what you would actually want and sometimes not want uh, to get a general idea what size of generator that you may want. With proper planning and fuel storage, you can comfortably live four or more weeks during a power outing. This has been Bobby with Survival Existence, helping you help yourself. Subscribe to us on our YouTube channel, come visit us on Facebook, and come visit us and subscribe at our website at survivalexistence.com. Have a good day.